So our last speaker is probably the youngest plenary speaker, I think, of this conference. Uh, it's uh, Peter Coulier. He got his PhD in Leuven at the Catholic University in 2014. And uh, is now postdoc at the same university, but at the same time also visiting scholar in Stanford. And he won the ECOMAS uh, Best PhD Thesis Award last year. And in the same year, he won the Best PhD Thesis Award from the Belgian Committee for Theoretical and Applied Mechanics. So uh, the floor is yours. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And um, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, the ECOMAS committee for providing me this uh, award. I'm very uh, honored to be a recipient of this prestigious prize. And at the same time, I would like to thank the organizers of COMPLAS for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. Um, I should maybe mention that I was originally invited at another conference in, in Germany, and I couldn't go there, uh, and they were very kind to give this uh, alternative opportunity. I must admit, however, that my work doesn't really fit in the field of um, plasticity, but it does involve computational mechanics, so I hope it's never to less of interest to this, uh, to this audience. So I will give a very general overview of some of the work I've done within the frame of my um, PhD. And more specifically, I'm, I'm going to focus on the numerical modeling of soil structure interaction. And soil structure interaction is a, a phenomenon that can be very important if we analyze the dynamic behavior of civil engineering structures. And these kind of structures can be subjected to a variety of dynamic loads uh, of which earthquakes are, uh, of course, a very typical example. Um, so buildings, bridges, bridges, or nuclear power plants have to be designed to uh, sustain such dynamic loads. Other examples of dynamic excitation sources are wind and wave loads that are particularly important for the design of offshore structures, such as wind turbines or um, oil and gas platforms. And these are uh, natural sources of vibrations, but of course, there are many human activities that are also lead to um, a dynamic excitation in the built environment. And just to uh, mention a few examples, uh, blast loadings um, or construction activities are very important. And, and this is like the, uh, or this is a, oh, let me take the pointer, this is an example of um, impact pile driving. And if this is uh, close to existing buildings, this can have a, an, an important effect on these uh, surrounding uh, buildings. And so the last example that I'll focus on a bit more in the, at the end of this presentation is uh, road and railway traffic, and especially the expansion of high-speed uh, railway lines in Europe uh, leads to many vibration problems in buildings that are quite close um, to such uh, uh, high-speed railway lines or also that are in the vici vicinity of underground railway lines. So the effects of, of the consequences of vibrations on existing structures are threefold. Already at very small amplitudes, um, they may lead to malfunctioning of sensitive equipment. And so, uh, for example, nanotechnology facilities have to be designed that very, uh, very strict vibration criteria are met. At uh, a bit higher amplitudes, uh, the vibrations may be feelable by the, um, um, the human body, and as such leads to discomfort to people. And what you see here is the example of the IMAX movie theater in the center of London, where you have some busy roads and some underground railway lines. And, uh, there was a necessity to include base isolation between the foundations and the superstructure, not for seismic design, but purely to ensure the comfort of the spectators in, in the theater. And of course, at higher amplitudes, and then I refer specifically to the case of uh, earthquakes, uh, there might, of course, uh, occur structural damage. So these are problems that have a considerable economic and societal importance. And it's clear that numerical models are uh, indispensable, first of all, to understand these phenomena, and second, uh, we, we have to, or we need numerical tools to design efficient vibration countermeasures. And what you see here is an example that I'll come back to later on in the presentation. It's a, a barrier in the soil, that, and the aim of that is to, um, to mitigate vibration transmission from a certain source, for instance, the railway line, to buildings that could be um, in the vicinity of that source of vibration. So a very important feature in many of the problems that I introduced on the previous slides is that they involve a certain structure, but that structure is, of course, never isolated. It's always in contact with its environment, and, and it's, uh, well, it, it's founded on the soil. And the dynamic interaction between the structure on the one hand and the, and the soil on the other hand can be very important and should be taken into account in the numerical models if you want to have an accurate representation of, um, of, the, of the realistic setting. 
And taking this into account is quite a challenging task from a computational uh, point of view. Uh, because the soil is an unbounded medium, it also is uh, non-homogeneous, um, and that, uh, well, that brings some uh, difficulties. So, well, usually you have a, a very large variation of, of um, dynamic properties of the soil with space, but the most important one is, is often the variation of stiffness with depth. Usually you have soft, soft layers at the top with an increase of stiffness if you go uh, deeper uh, into the soil. So usually we represent uh, the soil as a, as a horizontally layered half space. Um, and there has been a remarkable progress in, in the past decades uh, with respect to uh, numerical techniques for solving such problems. But nevertheless, there are still many problems uh, that are beyond current computer capabilities. And there are actually two reasons for this. First of all, the historically, these kind of techniques have been developed for seismic design, but they usually involve uh, a pretty low frequency range of interest. And if you go to these new type of applications, for instance, when you try to predict railway-induced vibrations, we have to go to much, a much higher frequency range, so we need, we need a much finer discretization and hence much larger prob uh, models. And, and then, of course, a second reason is that uh, we can start with a simple um, representation of reality. For instance, if we want to analyze the, the, the behavior of this building subjected to a certain source of vibration, we could start with this simple model. But in reality, you usually will have an interaction of a certain structure with all its surrounding um, buildings. And if you want to take that into account, the model becomes, of course, much more complex and you need uh, more efficient modeling techniques. So in, in the remainder of this talk, I want to address three specific topics. Uh, the first two are related to uh, numerical modeling techniques for soil structure interaction problems. And more uh, specifically, I'm going to focus on coupled finite element and boundary element models. So in the second or in the third part, I'll focus on the specific application of um, railway induced vibration. So let's start with three-dimensional coupled finite element boundary element methods. So coupled finite element boundary element methods are a very elegant way for tackling this problem, uh, as we can use finite elements to discretize the structure, and uh, you could consider not only the actual structure but also some part of the soil in the vicinity of um, of that structure, and. These finite elements can then be coupled to boundary elements to account for the wave propagation in the soil. Um, the advantage of the, of the boundary element method is that you only need a surface discretization instead of a volume discretization. And the unbounded nature of the soil is inherently accounted for in the formulation. So you don't need any absorbing boundary conditions or, or perfectly mixed layers or so, so you don't have spurious reflections. Um, I should also mention that uh, when you use a boundary element formulation, you need the Green's function of that medium. You need the fundamental solutions. And if you want, want to do elastodynamic wave propagation, you can either use the full space uh, fundamental solutions, which are analytically known, but in that case, you need to discretize the free surface as well as all the different layer interfaces. Another approach is to use Green's functions of a layered half space, um, which you don't, you don't have analytical expressions for these. You need to compute them numerically, but the advantage is that in that case you only need to uh, um, discretize the soil structure interface and you don't have to care about discretizing the free surface or uh, the interfaces because that's inherently accounted for in the, in the Green's functions of the uh, formulation. So this is a very elegant approach as it allows us to, um, to have a detailed um, model of the, the structure on the one hand and we are able to account for wave propagation in the soil at the other hand. But unfortunately, uh, it comes at a high computational cost. And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, the boundary element part of the calculations are often the bottleneck. And the reason is that the matrices that we have to deal with, if I go back to the previous slide, these matrices that relate to the tractions and the displacements on the boundary, well, these are dense and symmetric matrices, as is represented here. So uh, the red color uh, represents uh, non-zero entries in the matrix. And you clearly see that it's a, a completely different nature uh, with respect to uh, the finite element formulation where you have sparse symmetric matrices. So the fact that these are dense matrices implies that the memory requirement to store these matrices grows quadratically with the problem size. And the computation time to solve the corresponding set of equations with a direct solver like uh, cause elimination even scales cubically. So this becomes prohibitive um, if you go to large scale problems. 
Another uh, issue we have to deal with is how do we actually couple the finite element and the binary element meta, uh, models, especially if we consider these as black box and we actually can't, or and we want a non intrusive um, approach. So I'll present some techniques to circumvent these bottlenecks. And more, more precisely for the um, binary element approach, I'll, I'll show how you can actually um, approximate the dense matrices by data sparse representation. And then for the coupling uh, issue, I'll uh, talk a bit more about iterative coupling techniques to come to an efficient uh, solution of the coupling problem. So first of all, how, how do we speed up the boundary element part of the calculation? Well, what we do is, uh, rather than considering the original dense matrix, we will uh, approximate it, uh, or we will represent it by an approximation in which uh, we keep some of the dense blocks, some, some of the, the red blocks, we keep as it is, but we replace many of the uh, red blocks by green blocks, and the green blocks are low rank approximations of our, um, of, our of these matrix blocks. And you can see this as a, a decomposition into the near field interactions and the far field interactions. And I'll illustrate how you can do this for the simple example of uh, this toy problem of a foundation on half space. And once again, as we uh, incorporate in this case the green's functions of the layered medium, we only need to discretize the soil structure interface. So deep. The boundary element mesh is quite simple. So what we do to uh, achieve this is we start with um, clustering our initial boundary element mesh into a, a hierarchy of smaller and smaller subclusters. And we do this until we reach a certain uh, level uh, at which every cluster contains a minimum number of elements or a minimum number of, uh, of ports. Once we've done that, we can identify clusters that are actually well separated. Um, and, and the corresponding blocks in the matrix represent far-field interactions. And these blocks uh, can be represented by low-rank approximations, uh, as I will show in, in a minute, for example, using a similar value decomposition. Uh, apart from these um, far-field interactions, we of course have the near-field interactions of every cluster with itself and with its neighbors, and uh, these are very strong interactions. We, we cannot make an approximation, so we keep these these blocks corresponding to the near field interactions as, um, as full rank matrix blocks. So, for people that are familiar with the fast multiple method, uh, in which you also distinguish between near field and far field interactions, this is actually an algebraic generalization of the fast multiple method. The main difference here is um, in the fast multiple method, you need the analytical kernel to uh, find a multiple expansion to distinguish between near and far field. This approach is a purely algebraic approach, so you don't need to, to have an expansion for your kernel for the Green's function, which is indeed the case here if we use uh, these Green's functions of a layered half space, as I mentioned here. So this can be seen as a generalization of the fast multiple. So um, why is this more efficient? Well, these, these um, Green blocks that I showed before are not stored entry-wise, but we make a low rank approximation in which the rank k is substantially smaller than the initial dimensions of that matrix. And if we do that, um, if we only store this, this uh, um, tall and, and fat matrix, we have a reduction of the amount of memory um, with respect to storing the full matrix, and also it enables fast matrix vector multiplications. And as such, uh, this is um, ideal to, to solve the corresponding set of equations with the, with the iterative solver in which we just evaluate a so in order to show the speed up, um, or the, 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 um, be the benefits of using this approach, I've shown you, uh, I show here uh, the memory requirement to store the binary element matrix, matrices as a function of the number of degrees of freedom. So the blue line is the traditional classical method where you use a dense matrix, and you see quadratic growth of memory, and the red line is what you achieve if you use these hierarchical matrices, uh, very distinguished between near and far, far field interactions. And so in this particular example, the, uh, with the limit of the memory on, on this particular machine, uh, you're limited to about 40,000 degrees of freedom with the uh, classical approach, and you're able to extend that to about 400,000 degrees of freedom with the same amount of memory. So you, you increase the problem size with an order of magnitude. On the right-hand side, you see the computation time as a function of the number of degrees of freedom. You see for the classical approach, the blue line, a cubic um, increase because of the direct solve, and you have a huge savings uh, if you use the, the hierarchical approach, which is shown by this uh, red line. 
So just an example, what we, well, as we can increase the, the model size, we're able to go to much higher frequencies um, than before, and, and that's one application um, where you can use this, this uh, technique for higher frequencies of interest. So this is the wave field uh, due to unit displacements uh, of a foundation at a particular frequency, so this is one of the case. Uh, another example is uh, where you consider scattering of an incident uh, P wave due to uh, an irregularity, in this case it's a semispherical canyon. Um, once again, you can go to much higher frequencies than what you could do with a classic approach. So, speeding up the boundary element part of the calculation is, is, is one part, but the second part is uh, you need also an efficient way of coupling the uh, finite element and boundary element uh, methods. And if you want a non-intrusive um, uh, methodology, what ends up, what turns uh, out, well, the, the only option you actually, or one of the only options you actually have is to, uh, to, to iterate between the finite element and boundary element subtly. So we've been looking at techniques to, to do this in an efficient way. And so one example is what, what could be seen as a sequential Neumann Dirichlet uh, algorithm, where, where you uh, apply no, Neumann boundary conditions on the uh, finite element subdomain, gives you displacements, you apply these to the boundary element subdomain, you get a new estimation of the interaction forces and you iterate until you hopefully converge. Uh, the problem is that uh, you don't know, always get convergence, uh, especially if you have models formulated in the frequency domain. If you evaluate a finite element model at a, a frequency close to the resonance frequency, and as it's non-coupled to the soil, it's very hard to uh, achieve convergence. So you need to introduce some relaxation, and you have a relaxation parameter to ensure our, well, and also to uh, speed up the, uh, the convergence behavior. And it turns out, well, I don't have the time to go in detail, but um, it, it's pretty hard to find a, a, a relaxation parameter that ensures convergence in all cases. And we have done some, um, some work on that. I just want to show uh, an application. Once again, we have a surface foundation. Noted that a frequency which is close to one of the resonance frequencies of the foundation as such. And here you see the, the variation of the displacements and attractions as a function of the iteration step. So what you see here in the beginning is that the process tends to diverge, and if you wouldn't uh, include the relaxation in your iterative algorithm, well, you would immediately diverge and you would never converge to the actual solution. So including this relaxation term, or this relaxation step, is very important uh, in this iterative method. So that was an example in the frequency domain. Um, you can also do the transient um, calculations in the time domain. And the main advantage of using an iterative method is that you can use different time steps for the finite element and the boundary element subdomain. And this is just one application here, in the start animation once again, where we have uh, an impact on a concrete pile, uh, which leads to pressure wave in the pile itself, and then the railway wave uh, in the soil, and which can have an impact on the surrounding frequency. So once again, the main advantage here is that you can use um, different time steps for both subdomains. So having a, a fast boundary element method, along with an efficient way of coupling finite element and boundary element, uh, we are now able to um, investigate much larger problems than, than we used to. And one application is um, the, the response of, of buildings in a city-like environment. Rather than calculating the response of one building to an incident wave field, we are now able to calculate the, the response of this whole set of buildings, taking the cross-coupling of these buildings into account. So this is uh, an incident wave field at a particular frequency, and this is the response of the combined set of buildings. Uh, once again, I don't have time to go in detail, but it turns out that at high frequencies, if the wavelength becomes comparable to the, the dimensions of the building and comparable to the distance between the buildings, this cross-coupling actually becomes very important. So having a, a tool that is able to account for this cross-coupling, uh, well, provides a way to get a better understanding of, of these phenomena. So we're now able to solve much larger problems with the same computation resources, but that still requires a pretty high, uh, often a high computation effort, and we often need uh, high performance computing facilities. Uh, so is there a way to, leave, to speed up these calculations uh, so that we can solve them on a, on, a, on a regular laptop rather than a cluster? And so for a specific case of problems, can actually go from a 3D formulation to a simplified representation, which is called a two and a half dimensional formulation. And the idea is that for structures that have a 
invariant geometry in a certain direction, we actually can uh, limit ourselves to uh, a 2D discretization rather than a 3D discretization. So if we uh, want to analyze this dam on a half space, we could, of course, use a full 3D model, but that would be quite expensive. So what we do is we limit ourselves to a 2D discretization of the domain, but we account for the uh, third dimension through a, a transformation from the spatial domain to the wave number domain. So what happens is you use a Fourier transform from uh, space to wave number. Uh, you assemble and solve the governing equations in the wave number domain for each wave number uh, separately. So you can easily do this in parallel. And then you go back from the um, uh, wave number to the spatial domain. And this is, of course, a very efficient approach because you only have a 2D discretization of the problem, so you have a very limited number of uh, degrees of freedom. The main disadvantage of this approach is, of course, that you have to assume that the structure is infinitely long. Um, and in practice, there, that might not always be the case. If I go back to the, the picture I show here, this is a wave barrier next to a railway track. In the first assumption, you can assume it's infinitely long, but in practice, it will always be of limited length. And when you want to account for the limited length of such a structure, once again, you need a full 3D computation. So, the question we asked ourselves was, can we uh, use a two and a half dimension model that is very efficient, but at the same time account for the finite length of that structure, so for its full 3D dimension character. And it turns out, that similar developments have been made in the field of fiber acoustics, and then we can also use them here in, uh, when modeling soil structure interaction. And what you can do is you can first do a calculation uh, in which you assume the structure to be infinitely long, so a um, two and a half D calculation, and then do a convolution of these results in the wave number domain with a function, a windowing function, so it's actually a rectangular window, which in the wave number domain corresponds to such a sync function. And if you do that, you have a and this is the key that is called the fiber acoustics uh, spatial windowing. If you do that, your spatial window results actually come from the diffraction around the edges. So let me illustrate this for a simple example of uh, a trench in the soil. Once again, this is related to uh, uh, mitigating the transmission of waves, like, uh, for example, coming from railways. So on the top you see a uh, wave field uh, in case you have a, a trench which is assumed to be infinitely long. So this is the origin of two and a half years long. And then in the second, third, and fourth row are cases in, in which we assume that the trench has a final length of 15, 30, and 60 meters. So these are the results with the spatial window. On the right hand side, you see the same, uh, the same or the, the results obtained with a full two dimension calculation. Actually, you see uh, an almost perfect correspondence between the results of the two, two techniques. So it turns out that this technique is, is pretty accurate. But the main savings, of course, well, but this technique leads to a major saving in computational cost. So the numbers you see here is the, the number we required uh, to store the fiber element matrices and the total computation time. And you see that uh, if you compare this to full 3D formulation, uh, you have a huge uh, uh, saving. So the number between brackets are, are if you would use like a classical fiber element approach for dense matrices. So these numbers that you see here are with the fast approach that they introduced in the first part of the talk. So we already have substantial savings in memory and computation time. But then if you compare it to the space window we actually have a reduction of memory with a factor of 10,000 and then a, a reduction of computation time with a factor of 5,000. So these examples, what I showed you here, uh, have actually been uh, computed on the laptop for all these input theorems on, on the list. So that brings me to the final part of this presentation. I want to talk a little bit more about the specific case of railway news and operations. So, um, I've introduced it before, but this is mainly um, um, a problem of, of comfort. So the, the amplitudes are usually too low to cause damage to buildings, but nevertheless, they cause uh, malfunctioning of equipment and they, they can be very annoying to people. So uh, there's a strong need to develop efficient vibration transfer. And generally speaking, we can distinguish three types of uh, countermeasures. Either we tackle the problem at the source, so by uh, modifying the track properties, but if you talk to a railway operator, they, they won't be able to do that. The other option is to go to the receiver and try to modify uh, the properties of the building, but that's often very difficult if it's an existing building. It's very hard, for example, to do phase isolation. So the most uh, economical approach is often to intervene on the transmission path between the source and the vibration. 
And so uh, a technique we've been uh, focusing on is the one where you put a barrier next to a railway track. And it's important that, uh, to mention that we assume that this barrier is much more stiff than the surrounding soil. Maybe I should mention that traditionally, uh, this type of measures, well, the, the typical example of this type of measures is what I've um, introduced here, is an open trench. You actually cut the transmission part between the source and receiver. The problem is that, uh, in practice, such an open trench is unstable and it's very hard to realize. And what people have usually been doing is to, to fill an open trench with a soft material, such as a foam material, to mimic the behavior of an open trench. But it turns out that we still have stability problems, and that the efficiency of a soft trend, or a soft layer is actually not that good. So what we have been looking at can be seen as some kind of paradigm shift where we fill the barrier with a material that is different than the surrounding soil. So we didn't know we could work with using uh, having these computational tools, we were able to investigate whether such an approach would be efficient or not. And what you see here are uh, waves and soil into a, a, a harmonic load and five, thirty, and sixty words. On the left hand side, but this is our reference case without a barrier. On the right hand side, you see that we have included a barrier of two by two meter with a, a, a young soil that is four times as high off of the surrounding soil. And we see at low frequencies um, that barrier actually has no effect at all. Uh, so on the right hand side, we uh, quantify the search amount, which actually gives you the reduction in the weather in scale. So we don't see a reduction at all. But from a certain frequency upwards, so here it's 30 hertz, you see that there's a, a central area behind the barrier where we still don't have any reduction. But you have clear reduction right here in, at a certain angle. And it's even more clear if you look to the insertion loss. Uh, these dark red values can be indicate a reduction by a factor of more than two. <coughs> Maybe then we go to even higher frequencies. Once again, you see that there's almost no reduction in the central area behind the barrier. There's a very strong reduction in this zone delimited by this, this angle. And this angle tends to be uh, higher than three. So we were a bit, I mean, we were a bit puzzled by this result, but it turned out, turns out you can actually explain them very well by considering the distortion relations of the relative waves in the soil and of the bending waves in the barrier. So this is the top view of the soil and the barrier. So the, the wave of the soil can be decomposed in this uh, set of plane waves. Each of these plane waves has, has a certain relative wave. But what the barrier observes is this, this trace wavelength. And what happens is the following. If this wavelength is smaller than the, bending, the free bending wavelength of the barrier, the bending stiffness of the barrier will dominate and will actually block uh, the propagation of these waves. And this is very similar to the uh, phenomenon of coincidence in uh, acoustics. And so this leads to a critical frequency, which is given by the intersection of the dispersion curves of the rail waves in the soil and the bending waves in the barrier, and also gives rise to this, uh, this critical angle. So we can obtain um, some analytical formulas to explain this. So unfortunately, we would like to, um, um, to test and whether the net behavior can also be seen in practice and whether such a barrier is indeed as efficient as the numerical simulations tend to indicate. So I was involved in a, in a European project uh, in which a barrier, a stiff barrier, was actually uh, installed in practice at the Spain at the site in Spain, which is actually not so far from here. So you see here the construction of the barrier. It's uh, seven and a half meter deep, um, has a width of one meter and a length of 55 meter. And so this shows you how this can be constructed. And so we've saw, done some tests uh, during train passages. One of these here is a, a top view on the end of the railway track. This is a test section where the barrier has been included, and we have two measurement points uh, behind the barrier where we track the reduction. While this uh, section, which is a bit further away, is a reference section where no barrier has been included and we don't expect any reduction. So what you clearly see is that during the passage of the train, <coughs> the, the peak amplitude at the um, test section with the barrier is a factor of three lower than at the reference section with the barrier. So it tends, well, it is tends to confirm our, um, our computations and indicate that the barrier is very good. Um, so, for the sake of time, I'll skip these results, but I'll just show uh, uh, in more detail the efficiency of the barrier. Uh, and I'll skip to the conclusions. So, I just want to mention that this 